Right, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 6 in the textbook of Sengel and Gijar. We've started with the fundamentals of convection. It is quite a long chapter and many of it is fluid mechanics in which you've already done last year. Okay. But what we're going to do now is we're going to add the heat transfer, but we need to add it in context. Okay, so I can't just give you all the heat transfer stuff. We need to put it into the right places in fluid mechanics. And that is why very quickly I'm going to some of the fluid mechanics stuff and I'm adding with it the heat transfer part. Because it's very, very important for the next three chapters, which are on external forced convection, internal forced convection, and natural convection. Okay, then we've already done the first parts, which were uh, the physics of convection, the classifications of fluid flow, velocity boundary layer, the thermal boundary layer, laminar and turbulent flow, heat and mass transfer in turbulent flow, and the derivations of differential convection equations we've already discussed. And with the previous, previous lecture, we've started looking at the solutions of convection equations for a flat plate. We didn't finish it, and this is some of the most important uh, work that we've done and that I've pointed out, so let's just look at it very, very quickly. Okay, so the flat plate, you did the derivation of the flat plate in the test. This one is different in the sense that the viscosity now plays a huge role and it's not only the U component of velocity but the V component also. And the same equations, the continuity equation, the momentum equation, the energy equation. We've looked at all the different sizes of the terms, which ones we can take away, etc. We've looked at the, at the boundary conditions, and this was a problem up to the 1908, which hasn't been solved. Now, why was that this such a very, very important problem? Because that was just before the time of aerodynamics, uh, the development of flight, and with the stream function approach that we have already done, it was possible to solve the velocities outside or far away from a body, but not close to the body. Okay, so they couldn't solve drag because viscosity was not in all the equations. And also with the stream function approach, you could get the lift, but again, you couldn't get the drag. Okay, so in the time of Prandtl, I'm going to come back to Prandtl just now, a lot of work has been done, and Blasius was one of his first PhD students. Now, Blas, uh, Prandtl had sort of an idea, you know, how the solutions should look like, but they couldn't get it out. And Blasius was the guy who got it out, and what he did is he said, well, let me define a similarity variable eta, which looks like that, and then what I then can do is I can take these first two partial differential equations, and the result can be, together with the stream functions, I can get one ordinary differential equation. Okay. And in that, where f is equal to that. Now, again, that is not an easy equation to solve, and he solved it with the power series. In mathematics, you've done it, so you should also be able to do that. It's not easy, it's a lot of work. Another approach these days is that it can be solved with the third order Runga Kuta method very, very easily. Okay. Now, the results are typically, as we see in many cases, a result. Okay. But I would like to take out some of the most important ones from you, for you. Okay. Now, where eta is equal to zero, f is equal to zero, and the f, the eta is equal to zero, and that is equal to 0.332. Okay. And I'm not going to give you all the values. Obviously, you can give the solution over a wide range. But I'm just going to put in some of the values of the solution. And it is in your textbook. Typically, eta is equal to 0.5. F is equal to 0.042. And the F the eta is equal to 0.166. And that is equal to 0.331. So, and at 1, it is equal to 0 point, uh, 0.136, 0 0.330, and 0.323, etc., etc. And then here's a value of 4.91. 
where that would be equal to 0.99, there's another value there, and you can go up to 6, then it is equal to 4.280, and here it would be 0.999, even more, and 0.002. Okay. Now we've discussed it many times that it's very easy to do calculations, but the art and the engineering judgment sometimes in looking at your results and seeing things that make sense and identify important things from things which are not important. And that is exactly what Blasius has did. Because in this solution, he picked up something very, very important. What would that be? Do you remember when we looked at the velocity boundary layer? Where did we say, do we define the velocity boundary layer? We said if we look at the free stream velocity, okay, then at 99% of the free stream velocity, that is the boundary layer thickness. Okay, which means it is equal to u divided by v, which is equal to uh, sort of 0.99. 0.99, okay. okay. Why is that important? Because it also now gave that value there, okay. And if we now think of that similarity solution of eta, which is equal to y divided by v, x the uh, v, uh, the kinematic viscosity divided by x. Okay. If we look at y divided by x, okay, we've said that that is equal to the boundary layer thickness where that velocity u divided by v is equal to 0.99. Okay. So what does it mean? It means eta is equal to 4.91, okay. when y is equal to the boundary layer thickness, okay, <laughs> you see, multiplied by the rest, okay, and what you can do is you can manipulate it now a little bit in solving the boundary layer thickness, you can write it as 4.91 divided by V kinematic viscosity x and by doing a little bit of manipulation, multiplying by x, etc., you can clean it up so that you can then solve that the boundary layer thickness is equal to 4.91 divided by the Reynolds number x. Okay. Reynolds x means the Reynolds number defined at a distance x. Okay. The Reynolds number defined at a distance x. Let's just look at a trivial calculation. And uh, maybe Professor Wesley Harris, when he was sitting on the aeroplane on his way to South Africa, was thinking about it. <laughs> when you're very bored, you can start thinking of very strange things. But sometimes it is important that you should look at it and make some order of magnitude calculations so that you can just get an idea of what these things sometimes mean. Now let's suppose he was there on the Airbus and he was traveling in air of course, typically at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, velocity of maybe 100 meters per second, Mach number of 0.3. Okay. And he was wondering now on this aeroplane wing, Okay, I'm wondering at a distance from one meter from the leading edge or two meters, what would the boundary layer thickness be? Okay. Now let's just do some calculations just to get an idea for that, for this. So at x equal one meter, you can then calculate the Reynolds number at one meter, which would then equal, be equal to rho v divided by x 
divided by V. Okay. Remember, X is now the distance from the leading edge. So that would be, let's suppose the density is approximately 1. Obviously at 10,000 meters it is um, about 0.3, but let's just use 1 as an order of magnitude calculation. The velocity is about 100 meters per second, 1 meter from the leading edge, and the viscosity of air about 1 multiplied by 10 to the minus 5. And the result would be a Reynolds number of approximately 10 million, or 1 multiplied by 10 to the 7. Okay, so that would be the Reynolds number at one meter from the leading edge. Obviously, we make the assumption that the aeroplane wing is a flat plate, <coughs> which is not a great as assumption, but just for a start. Obviously, at x equal to two meters, if we do the same calculation, the Reynolds number now at two meters would be just x would now be equal to two. You agree? So you'll see that the Reynolds number increases as you go down from the leading edge. Okay. So the Reynolds number, where x is equal to 2, should be about 2, 20 million. Okay. And now we can go and calculate the boundary layer thickness at 1 meter from the leading edge, which be, would be equal to... 4.91. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, sorry if we can just come back here. So I forgot something. There should be an x there. 4.91 multiplied by x divided by the square root of the Reynolds number. So that would be multiplied by x divided by the Reynolds number. 1 multiplied by 10 to the 7. And that would give us about a thickness of about 1.5 millimeters. Okay. About 1.5 millimeters. And if we do the same calculation for 2 meters, then it wouldn't be double, because you can see there's a square root relationship. So then it would work out as 2.1 millimeters. Okay, now, <coughs> remember as I've said that when people started looking at the aerodynamics in the time of Prandtl, this was the aeroplane wing, <laughs> like that. With the stream function approaches and many of the other work, they could actually get all the velocities and pressures outside the boundary layer. Okay. But they couldn't get it inside the boundary layer. So, bound, so Blasius was the, the guy who actually made the breakthrough for us in getting into the boundary layer. And it looks like a very trivial, trivial result, but it was really a very, very important breakthrough. Now, what is interesting is that Blasius actually said, after achieving great fame for all his accomplishments in fluid mechanics, he gave it up. He is quoted as saying, I decided that I had no gift for it. All of my ideas came from Prandtl. <laughs> okay. Now, Prandtl was really a great guy. Okay, now he lived from 1875 to 1953, a German engineer. He is described as a pioneer in the development of a rigorous systematic mathematics and analysis, which he used for underlying the science of aerodynamics. In the 1920s, he developed the mathematical basis for the fundamental principles of subsonic aerodynamics in particular, and in general up to and including transonic velocities. His studies identified the boundary layer, the thin aerofoil and lifting line theories, and the Prandtl number was named after him. Very interesting. Uh, he actually was a graduate at uh, the Technische Hochschule in Munich. In, 19, in 1984, he graduated with his PhD under the guidance of Professor Foppel. And then he worked at Munich, where firstly he worked in solid mechanics, and his first job was an engineer designing factory equipment. Then he entered the fluid mechanics, where he really did a lot of work. And he ended up being a professor at Hannover, at Hannover, Hannover, now the Technische University Hannover. Okay. And it was here where he developed most of his important theories, 
Uh, for example, in 1904, he delivered the groundbreaking paper fluid flow in very little friction. Okay. And all the work is just so too much, I, you know, I can't describe it to, to all of you, but what's very interesting is that the, at the age of 34, he decided it, it was time to marry. So he went to his old professor, August Foppel, to ask his daughter's hand in marriage. <laughs> but, but he didn't say which daughter. He didn't say which daughter. So the professor and his wife had a hurried discussion and very wisely decided it should be the older one. Apparently he had the younger one in mind. <laughs> and uh, that was fine. The marriage was a long and happy one. Okay. Okay, now, and he worked at Gottingham until he died in 1953. Uh, his work in fluid mechanics is still used today in many areas of aerodynamics and chemical engineering, and is often referred to as the father of modern aerodynamics. And the crater Prandtl on the far side of the moon is named in his honor. Okay. Now, Blasius, you know, when Blasius wrote this, I... Uh, I decided I wanted to read a little bit about Blasius and what he did. And he was also a very interesting guy. Uh, as, you, as you've heard, that uh, he decided that he didn't really have any talents and sort of gave it up. Uh, he was a student of Prandtl's, uh, but before that, uh, it's a very, very long story, and I can put the article for you on ClickUp. But, uh, he said, at Easter 1902, I had set my final college examination and was now studying mathematics. This was not simple for me. Although one can see what follows from certain algebraic manipulations, why would this be done? He said, by mathematics, you are convicted instead of convinced. <laughs> and then it, it took him a long time studying different, in different areas. He studied in philosophy, I was asked to work on in home, homogeneous waves generated due to total uh, reflection in a second medium as a PhD topic. This was of interest to Professor Voigt, but not to me. And then I continued with Professor Prandtl and submitted a PhD thesis on boundary layer flow in July 1907. And this is very interesting. I also added two or three cases for this theory. He told me after the exam that I hadn't known all that he wanted. <laughs> But he said that what I knew, I had understood, and I was satisfied. Okay. Then uh, he went to Gottingham, yeah, he was then at Gottingham under Prandtl, and then he became a professor at the University of Applied Sciences in Hamburg. And he was active in teaching until 1970, when he died at the age of 86. And what he said is, uh, I distinguish between exact knowledge and learning. As a good teacher, you should, always, you should allow students to use their notes during exams and ask questions on the integral knowledge. My concern is specialization, and forgive me, the present trend in increasing lectures in other branches enhances this. Finally, consider our students. Precious people often interested in knowledge. Certainly, they would also like to earn money, but by working. They are willing to learn, care for them, for they trust you and they are devoted to advance. Why at the end I am still here? Certainly not because of interest in the subject or, or because of money. The only reason I stayed for so long is because of my affection for youth, whom I should like to help in solving problems and to insist into a profession. Here I am and here I stay until I am thrown out. <laughs> okay, and as I've said, uh, he died at the age of 86, and at that stage he was still teaching at uh, the University of Hamburg. Okay, right, so that's a little bit of history. Let's go back to what now happened as a result of this. And how, how, does it, how do we get this into the heat transfer? So this is now the fluid mechanics part that you should be familiar with and that you already did. Okay, now what was also important is the shear stress on the wall. As you know, it is equal to the viscosity multiplied by partial du dy, where y is equal to zero. But with all this, if you look very carefully, it can also be written as 
the viscosity multiplied by the velocity multiplied by the square root of the velocity divided by the kinematic viscosity divided by x multiplied by partial d2f d eta square where eta is equal to zero. Okay, again, just mathematics. <laughs> but it was people like, like Blausius who looked at it very, very carefully and again identified something very important. And that is this term here, d 2 f d eta squared, where eta is equal to zero, is that. Okay? You see it? And then the result is that now you can write the shear stress as equal to 0.332 multiplied by rho v squared divided by the square root of the Reynolds number of you, after you've done a little bit of manipulation. <coughs> And if you want to write it as the local friction coefficient, which is equal to tau on the wall divided by rho v squared divided by 2, can be written as 0 0.664 multiplied by the Reynolds x to minus a half. So again, that was a very, very important a breakthrough from Blasius because now it was possible to calculate the drag on a flat plate for the first time. Okay. Now this work, although Blasius firstly did it on a flat plate, was later extended to other geometries like over cylinders and spheres and then they started actually also solving on, on the trailing edge of a cylinder all the separation, the flow separation. So all this work actually made it possible. Now this is the fluid mechanics part. How do we get to the heat transfer? Well, there's this lonely equation still here. <laughs> so after Blasius solved the first two equations with the similarity variable, he looked at the energy equation and he said, ha, oh, wait a minute, I can here also make a plan. Okay. And we are not going to go through all the mathematics because we don't have time but the result of that if you look carefully then you can write it as two times d2 theta d eta square plus prandtl multiplied by f d theta d eta is equal to zero okay now if you see that you can replace theta by the f d eta, okay. then you can actually generate the same equation with one very important if. <laughs> and what is that if? <laughs> if you make the assumption that Prandtl number is equal to one. Okay. And when or for what fluids is a Prandtl number approximately equal to one? All gases, approximately order of magnitude is approximately one. Okay. So if you then recognize that, listen, if I make this one, <laughs> then I actually get the same equation then for the fluid mechanics part. And the result of that was history. And it was possible then to get the thermal boundary layer as firstly, the boundary layer thickness divided by Prandtl to the third very very important breakthrough and the result is that the boundary layer thickness can then be written as 4.91 divided by Prandtl to the third and again the square root of the Reynolds number or if you write it in terms of the Nusselt number then it is equal to 0.332 multiplied by Prandtl to the third and Reynolds to the half. Okay. 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 So from fundamental boundary layer theory, the Nusselt number can be solved as a function of 
Reynolds number and Prandtl number. Question? So I think you're missing an X in the equation. Mm, uh, this one, yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Mistakes. Yep. Okay. So, valid, of course, for Prandtl approximately, well, one. And if you do experiments, you will see that for many experiments with typically air, typically Brundle numbers of about 0.6, the results are quite valid, very, very useful. Okay, okay now again, look at this 0.332. Okay, 0.332, again, this is where it comes from. So it comes from the solution of the differential equations. Okay. Something that is now very important is that if we look at the Nusselt number, the Nusselt number which is equal to the heat transfer coefficient L divided by K, if we look at the Prandtl number which is equal to Cp the viscosity divided by K and uh, the Reynolds number which is equal to Rho Vd divided by the viscosity. If we look at that, then we always get into the situation where we have two temperatures. So, we, for example, would have the flat plate at a certain temperature, and we will have the free stream velocity at another temperature. Okay. And from the previous lecture, I've shown you how some of these variables it's a function of temperature. Okay. In many cases, not a strong function, but they are. Okay. So the question that always comes in is, now if I have to go and get these values, at what temperatures should I do it? Okay. Now normally what we do is we say, we define what we call the film temperature. The film temperature is then the average of the, those two. So it's that one plus, plus that one divided by two. So normally what we do is all the, Re the Reynolds numbers, the Prandtl numbers, and the Nusselt numbers are all defined with the variables at that temperature. Okay. Now this is very important because why is it important? Because although this relationship has been developed now for the Nusselt number for, flat for a flat plate, many of the practical things that we would like to solve are not that easy to solve. Okay. We have to do experiments to get the results. Okay. So in this field of, and that is paragraph 10, 6.10 in your textbook, which is the functional forms, functional forms. If we look at, exp if we look at exper experimental work in fluid mechanics and heat transfer, then you will see that, okay, for the people doing fluid mechanics, in comparison with the heat transfer people, okay, what are the important things that needs to be done when you do experiments? If you look at the results, you will see that if you're interested in the friction coefficient okay, or the friction factor or whatever, in fluid mechanics, typically when we do wind tunnel experiments, we want to get the drag, especially from a boundary layer point of view. Okay. So then we will always do the experiments as a function of Reynolds number. Okay, so that would be typically the experiments, okay, like that. And as I've said, when we do the experiments, we would use the film temperature, and in this case, the film temperature is the same, because there's no temperature difference between that one and that one. They are the same, okay? When we do heat transfer experiments, then we want to get the Nusselt number, okay? And typically, the Nusselt number experiments will be conducted as a function of Reynolds number. Okay. So let's suppose those are the results. Okay. If you just look at 
the flat plate theory it tells you uh, it's not going to really work very well if there are large temperature variations you also need to look at the Prandtl number so you would typically do experiments at different Prandtl numbers okay so it becomes a little bit more complicated and in general you will see that from wind tunnel experiments the CF is always one or other function of the Reynolds number while in heat transfer it would be normally all the experiments in most cases can be written in the following format the Nusselt number is a constant multiplied by the Reynolds number based on the characteristic length multiplied by M multiplied by Pondel to the N okay where C is normally has to do with the geometry okay and M and N are constant constant usually between 0 and 1 okay. so most experiments can be written in this type of format except if there are experiments where buoyancy also plays a role so if we have buoyancy also let's rather write it as natural convection okay then the Nusselt number is a function of a constant multiplied by Reynolds to the M Prandtl to the N multiplied by the Grassoff number and we will define the Grassoff number later when we do at, when we do natural convection experiments and then there's also another constant there okay, while you finish writing there I just want to clean the board on the side Okay, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> okay. Now the last the last part of this chapter is actually to me one of the most brilliant parts of nature. <laughs> okay. And that is paragraph 6.11 and that is about the analogies analogies between momentum and heat transfer analogies between momentum and heat transfer okay. okay now if you look at as I've said very critically at all the theory it is obvious how we can see all the similarities between fluid mechanics and heat transfer okay and again without doing all the detail but it led to what is called the Reynolds analogy Okay, Reynolds analogy, Professor Reynolds at Manchester University, named after the Reynolds number. But what you can do is, and we don't have all the time for the mathematics, it's in your textbook, but what you can now do is you can actually so show that CF, the friction coefficient, okay, take note, the local one, so not the average one at a specific point, okay, multiplied by Reynolds based on L divided by 2 is equal to the Nusselt number and this is valid for again Prandtl equal to 1 just another equation of so many <laughs> but what does it do? it now connects momentum, it, momentum uh, the second law of, of Newton with energy there's an analogy in nature what does it mean? It means if you do experiments in the lab where you measure the drag, you can actually from that measurement get the Nusselt number 
and know what the heat transfer characteristics will be. Again, that was now for the limitation where the Prandtl number is equal to 1. Okay, now after that, okay, before we introduce, okay, be, okay bef before I do that, let's just define uh, the Staunton number. Okay. This can also be written as CF divided by 2 is equal to the Staunton number. Okay, so ST is the Staunton number. And it is equal to the Nusselt number divided by the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. Okay. Now Chilton and Colburn worked on this problem specifically to remove that limitation. Okay. So Chilton and Colburn and because of that, it is now called the chilton Corbin analogy. Okay. And what they then do, did is they proved that CFx multiplied by the Reynolds number divided by 2 is equal to the Nusselt number x prandtl to the minus 2 thirds. Or if you clean it up, you can write it as CFx divided by 2 is equal to the Staunton number x prandtl to the 2 thirds. Okay. Staunton x, what, what would it mean? It would mean that where we, where we calculate the Reynolds number, it would be at position x. Okay. Or it can be written as CFx divided by 2 is equal to the J factor. And now it is valid for bundle numbers larger than 0 0.6, smaller than 60. Now except for the fact now that we remove the Prandtl number limitation of 1, why would that be of importance to us? It would be of importance because Prandtl numbers approximately 1 would be all gases. If we look at the Prandtl number of fluids, what would it be? Order of magnitudes. It would be intense. Water for example, about 7. So Prandtl number, order of magnitude 10. So now it made it also possible that with this analogy you can actually use wind tunnel results, drag results, and from that calculate the Nusselt number characteristics of how much heat can be transferred. Okay. Let's look at a very very simple case. Okay, Let's suppose your friend has been given the task of, in the lab, for a plate of 3 meters by 2 meters to determine the drag on it in water at 20 degrees Celsius and it has been pulled at 3 meters per second. Okay. That is the experiment that was given by the professor to your friend and you were given the same experiment but to determine the Nusselt numbers. Okay. Alright, so if you are clever and you know about the chilton Colburn analogy, you're going to spend your time doing other things because if you can get these results, his CF value, you can calculate the Nusselt number very easily. Okay. So let's look at it. Uh, Properties of water, okay. typically density 998 kilograms per cubic meters. Okay, the CP is equal to 4182 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Uh, K is equal to 0.598 watts per meter Kelvin. Prandtl is equal to 7.01 and the viscosity of water would be about 1 multiplied by 10 to the minus 3 K 
kilograms meters per second. Okay, now let's suppose your friend did go and calculate from the, from the results that he did in the lab. He would calculate or determine that let's suppose the drag is equal to 2 kilonewtons. Just an arbitrary value. <coughs> okay. So now from that we can say that the drag is equal to Cf multiplied by the surface area multiplied by rho v squared divided by 2. The drag would be 2 kilonewtons, so it's 2,000 newtons, multiplied by Cf, multiplied by the surface area of the plate, 2 multiplied by 3, multiplied by the density, 998, multiplied by the velocity squared, divided by 2. Are you happy with that? You fine? Remember the plate has two surfaces. Okay, so it is multiplied by 2. Okay. Surface of the drag would be on both sides of the plate. Okay. And the result would be that Cf is equal to 0.03704, something like that. And if we look at water, we can see that the Prandtl number of water is not equal to 1. So we cannot use the Reynolds analogy, it wouldn't be that accurate. We had to make use of the chilton colburn analogy. So that would mean Cf divided by 2 is equal to the Staunton number, Prandtl to the 2 thirds. Skin friction coefficient has been solved as 0.03704 divided by 2 is equal to the Staunton number multiplied by Prandtl 7.01 to the power of 2 thirds. And now we can solve the Staunton number as 0.005057. The Staunton number, um, I didn't do it in detail, but if you just go and do a little bit of manipulation and it is in your textbook, then you will see that the Staunton number can be written as the heat transfer coefficient multiplied, divided by rho, Cp and V is then equal to 0.0507. Okay. I'm not going to put in all the values, but you can go and calculate it at home, and that would give you a heat transfer coefficient of 63,439 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Or Calculate the Nusselt number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by L divided by K. The heat transfer coefficient is equal to 63,439. The characteristic length of the plate, and that is very important. You have to decide which one it is. Normally we would use that one. So if you do that, you must say the Nusselt number based on the plate with its length 3 meters is equal to 3 divided by the thermal conductivity is equal to 0.598 and that would give a Nusselt number of 318,000 approximately. Very high. Okay. This is a very, very important analogy which I think is not being used enough in industry and also in literature. 
The reason for that is that in many cases, the instrumentation that was available 50, 100 years ago were not that good. So people could see there's good analogies between the results. But these days, like in our lab, when we do very, very good experiments, very accurate measurements, if we go and look at the results of the friction factors, it's a function of missile number. Okay. Even through, for example, if you look at it in a pipe, and you get the transition like that, okay, it is being perfectly followed by the J factor. Perfectly. And the relationships are really very, very great, but you need very, very good experiments and instrumentations to actually show that. And once you've done that, it really makes your life very, very easy in terms of the relationships that can be developed. OK, any questions, ladies and gentlemen? If not, thank you very much. And then I will see you again on Wednesday. Okay.